Live from downtown Detroit, Local 4 News First at 4 starts now. Good afternoon, I'm Devin Skillian in today for Karen Drew. First at 4, prosecutors in the James Crumbly trial bring a critical piece of video into evidence today. The father of the Oxford High School shooter charged with four counts of involuntary manslaughter, Sean Lay, has been in the courtroom. And court ended pretty early today, Sean. About 2.30 today, that is early, the judge saying that they are making rapid progress in this trial and actually ran out of witnesses, she kind of joked. So sending the jury home, telling them to be healthy because someone in the gallery apparently is sick. But yes, yeah, sending them home. But again, even though it was a shortened type day, it was not short on emotion at all or news, uh, new information. Let's get right to that video we talked about because the jury heard from James Crumley from that video himself. Take a look. In court this afternoon, this trial was all about this video. The jury hearing from James Crumley in his own words in this dramatic, gut-wrenching video. You're looking at an Oakland County Sheriff's video of investigators bringing James and Jennifer Crumley into an interview room two and a half hours after their son shot and killed four Oxford High School students. Let me show you the key moment of this video. It's James Crumley telling sheriff's investigators that the nine millimeter handgun he bought for his son was not locked up, was not locked up with a cable lock, but hidden in an armoire in their bedroom. It was hidden in our armoire in the case. And the bullets were hidden in a completely different spot. All right, back here live. So at 5 o'clock, we're going to get to this because you heard what he said, uh, James Crumley, in that video. This is just hours after the shooting that he had hidden the gun, not locked it up, did not have that lock, cable lock on it, either hid the ammo as well that was not locked up. Uh, and then he rushed home to go find that. Prosecutors hammering home the point that he didn't offer more information they think is critical, Devin, in this. We're still working on that for 5 o'clock. We'll have it for you then. Bye. Back to you. You know, Sean, in the past 24 hours, we learned that James Crumbly's jail communications have been strictly limited. Uh, we first started to report on this last night at 11. Really interesting twist. What more do we know about the reasoning behind that? Like any inmate, he can use the telephone, which is recorded at the jail. He has a tablet for use as well to communicate with his attorney and others. That could be text message or some kind of messaging app or email. And what we got to the bottom of is that the court found that he was making some kind of threats to someone. Unclear how many threats or how many people were being threatened. We pulled the court document. It's just an order cutting off his communication, except for communication with his attorney and with a clergy member if he wants to talk to someone from the clergy. That's it right now. So there's a gag order here. We have not gotten to the bottom yeah. exactly to answer the question who's on the other side of those messages. Fascinating development that came uh, right after the day one of these uh, this testimony. Yes. All right, Sean, uh, we're going to talk uh, more about today's okay. key moments with Sean coming up at five and six. And remember, we are streaming the entire trial on Local 4 Plus. You see the testimony as it happens. Just download Plus wherever you find your streaming content or just scan the QR code on your screen right now. We'll have recaps and updates during our newscasts as well, of course. All right, stay away and don't turn fire debris into souvenirs. That is the message from authorities four days after that explosive fire in Clinton Township. We're told the scene is secure, but some people have been wandering around looking for canisters and other scraps. Authorities say it is too dangerous. You still need to stay away from the scene at 15 Mile and Grossbeck because firefighters are still monitoring hot spots. They estimate they have used about 2 million gallons of water on this scene. The investigation into exactly what caused the fire really hasn't started yet. Officials say they're going to need heavy equipment to move in to start breaking up the rubble first. And a funeral being held today for the 19-year-old killed by the flying debris. Authorities are still looking for answers and grateful that the fire wasn't even more deadly. Um, there certainly should have been more, you know, more injuries, more possible deaths on that scene. Um, how we managed to get through it with, you know, what we did, 
I can't answer that for you. I, there, there was something looking out for us that day. We will find out through our investigation what happened, who did it, who's responsible, and somebody will be held accountable. You've seen the shots of the debris field. It is stunning that more people weren't hurt. The investigation we expect is going to start in earnest next week. If you find any debris near your home or business in that area, call the number that you see on the screen, 586-469-5502, 586-469-5502. Michigan residents are going to pay a higher income tax this year, according to a new report from the Court of Appeals. Some business groups and others argued a drop in the tax rate was meant to become permanent. But the Attorney General, Dana Nessel, argued the law only provides for a temporary drop when state revenues exceed inflation. So your income tax rate for 2024 should be 4.25 percent. An appeal to Michigan's Supreme Court, though, is still possible. So this could all still move a little bit. We will keep following it and keep you posted. Been a gray and rainy day in downtown Detroit this Friday afternoon. Soggy start to the weekend. That's not looking too comfortable. Brett Collar in for Kim Adams with the first forecast. Brett? Yeah, we're going to keep the umbrellas if you're going to be out this evening. This weekend, though, a different story as we're talking cold wind and maybe some snow. Just a moment. In the meantime, all of southeast Michigan socked in the rain. For the most part, just light to moderate rain, but you can see some heavier pockets, these darker greens from Cape Ack, Romeo, Utica, over towards Pontiac. Also seeing some steadier rain, parts of Ann Arbor, Hamburg, over towards Farmington Hills, Livonia as well. We'll hang on to the rain chances through the rest of today, even parts of the overnight. But like I mentioned, this weekend, we could see a few flakes fly. We'll talk about when that may be in just a bit. All right, Brett. Michigan, of course, is cradled by four of the five Great Lakes. We are in a unique position to feel the brunt of climate change up close and personally. Paula Tutman has been working with a climatologist to get the cold, hard truth about the lack of ice on the Great Lakes this year and what that means moving forward. Take a look at this. Nothing on the St. Clair River. Nothing in Lake Huron, and, and this is going to affect everyone from the thumb all the way down through the Detroit River. I am shocked, yeah. The stunning lack of ice in the St. Clair River Channel and Lake Huron was startling to Dr. Ayome Fujisaki Minome, a climatologist with the University of Michigan and a researcher with the Cooperative Institute for Great Lakes Research. She's been collecting data on the lack of ice in the Great Lakes, but today, she saw it for herself for the first time this winter. Less ice and more open water. It's a perfect setup for lake effect snowstorm. And in some cases that could be lake effect ice storm. Normally we would be seeing ice cutting operations for navigation, but today we saw fishing boats and even a leisure boat. I worry that this could lead to some fundamental change in the, the coastal landscape. Normally there is 40% ice cover this time of year. Today there's only 2% in the entire Great Lakes. The season high only got to 16%. Climatologists say the data means we are at the leading edge of the end of Michigan winters as we know them. The culture and the recreation of ice fishing and snowmobiling will begin to slip away. The stress crashing waves with no winter reprieve given by ice will mean continued and more costly repairs to keep homes from slipping into a watery grave along the shore. And as far downstream as the Jefferson Chalmers area in Detroit, homeowners will have to mitigate against even more flooding. And those who watched with empathy will need to prepare to be in flood zones themselves for the first time. Says Dr. Richard Rood, Professor Emeritus of Climate and Space Sciences and Engineering at U of M. Compound flooding because it'll be a combination of things associated with lake levels as well as precipitation because if the water is high in the lakes when there's a lot of precipitation, it doesn't have anywhere to go when it gets down there to the coast. So it um, exacerbates the flooding that might be associated with lake levels. The cause and effect means we will have to start changing the way we see and react and prepare for winter, how we enjoy it recreationally, count on it economically, and survive it environmentally. We are going to have to relearn how to live with the weather. We're going to have to relearn how to live with the climate. And so what this means at the end of the day, climatologists are not saying, look, 
panic about this, but they are saying they need to study this more, understand this more, so that they can strategize and teach others how to strategize so that we can adjust to the way we're living based on this new climate. Paula Tupman, Local 4. All right, Paula, climatologists say there's no going back. The way to move forward is to study the changes in climate and use data-driven strategies for things like building codes, zoning ordinances, and to address the coming shifts in the economy.